Dr. Rich, and thank you all for coming. Um, my apologies for those of you who read through the 15,000 word manuscript I sent out. Um, <laughs> I'm going to focus today primarily on the Indonesian case, partly because of the timeliness related to the elections, um, and partly because the case, uh, in many respects, within this broader project is illustrative of sort of more nuanced, more, I think, in many ways, interesting relationships uh, and causal mechanisms than the large end um, multi-country study. And so I'm going to focus on that, although if anyone has questions on the multi-country stuff, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so today's talk is really about sort of the different ways we think of electoral reform uh, effects on democratic trajectory and in particular on issues of representation. Um, and so what I'd like to do before I get started on the case and the broader theory is to talk about what specifically I mean by electoral reform, right? Many different things about the electoral system can be reformed, everything from campaign finance issues uh, to issues of districting, uh, issues of election timing, length of campaigning. Today I'm really going to focus on a very specific type of electoral reform, and I'm going to talk about changes in the rules that govern how parties and or individual candidates are selected. So I'm not really going to talk about uh, campaign finance issues. I'm not going to talk about how and why uh, the legislative and executive elections are linked in Indonesia, although I'm happy to answer questions if anyone is particularly curious about that. But what I really mean today is very simple sort of rule changes. So let's say you have a ballot, party A, party B, and you vote for party A. So if you pr are presented with a ballot like this, you check party A or party B, and your vote goes to a party. Parties aggregate. Uh, individual votes and get percentages of the vote share and get a certain number of seats based on what percentage of the vote share they got. Parties then in this type of system distribute those seats uh, to their members and or candidates that they've listed sometimes before the election, sometimes they pick them after the election, varies tremendously. But in this case you as the voter only get to cast a vote for a party. This differs from a ballot that looks like this, party A and party B now have five candidates each, and you as a voter can cast a vote for any specific candidate you choose. And so rather than say party A, candidate number one, who likely in the other system is who gets chosen by the party, you specifically want candidate number three, and you can now, as a voter, choose not only the party, but the specific candidate from the party. Right? This is, for those of you who study elections, a drastic oversimplification of a change in the type of system. But it's sort of meant to just illustrate what I mean by an electoral reform and the types of issues that I'm looking at in this particular case. Okay? And so this is a very abstract way to think about it, but let's look at a more practical way to think about it. This is essentially a ballot that was used in 1999 for the first democratic elections in Indonesia. There are 48 parties, each with a symbol and a name and a number. And you as a voter would essentially choose one of these parties. Poke a hole through the ballot, right? And this was the choice. Now, of course, you're probably thinking 48's a lot of choices, so I have a lot of choices, right? <laughs> Not really constrained, but let's take a look at what the ballot looked like in 2009. And I couldn't actually put up a ballot. Trust me, you did not want me to put up a ballot, um, but I will show you. So just for some reference, of course, these are guys counting the ballots on uh, election day in 2009. The ballot is about this high. It's the size of a small child. Um, each party now, you'll see, still has the little logo, little symbol the name and a number based on when they registered, and now they each have a list of candidates underneath them. In 2009, uh, there were about 30 to 35 parties in any given district that ran substantial numbers of candidates, and each of them could present up to a full list for the slate of seats available. So in the districts that had 10 available seats that were very popular districts to contest, you as a voter would have a choice of probably somewhere in the vicinity of 300 individual candidates for a single seat. Right, so I, I realized that 48 sounded like a lot, but now you have a lot more, right? Um, and what this does is it really in many ways changes the potential for you as a voter to directly affect who is your representative and also signal in many ways to parties what it is that you might want out of the voting process. So rather than say, I just feel like letting the party make the decision for me, maybe you specifically wanted a particular candidate who campaigned on issues. Uh, maybe, as in some cases, you specifically did not want to vote for a certain type of candidate. You didn't want to vote for a woman. You didn't want to vote for a Christian. Now you have the ability to signal to parties some of those choices. Okay? And so these are the types of changes that I'm really going to focus on today rather than sort of broader changes within uh, sort of electoral politics, things like finance and timing. Okay? So 
I'm going to take a quick step back and look at why we study electoral reform, particularly these types of electoral reforms. Um, and I'm going to make the broader arguments, as I did in the paper, that part of the reason we study electoral reform is to look at how changes in the rules and how the rules um, lead to different types of election conduct affect competition. Right. So one case, you have 48 parties competing against each other. In the next, you have 300 individual candidates competing against each other. Changes the nature of competition. It often changes the type of issues that are discussed. Um, some of these electoral forms really get at issues of representation, particular subgroups of the population, particular types of candidates, and in some cases, particular types of parties that purport to represent specific subsets of the population. Electoral reform can affect things like party system fragmentation. Under certain types of systems, you will see larger and larger numbers of parties winning seats. Um, and what that means for longer term governance issues varies tremendously. Um, Indonesia has had, at various points in the last 15 years, sometimes 20 odd parties sitting in the legislature at the national level. Occasionally, at the subnational level, in 35 seat legislatures, you'll have 20 parties for 35 seats. Imagine trying to get anything done on a regular basis, it makes things a little difficult. Um, electoral reform can affect the degree of certainty, both on the part of parties and also the part of voters. Constantly changing a system might be good for some of these other things, but might also lead to lower voter education, less understanding about what it is that you're casting a ballot for, how, why, whether or not you did it in a valid way so that your vote even counts. And finally, I'm gonna argue that electoral reform in this type of capacity can sort of very directly affect democratic consolidation by virtue of affecting things like quality of competition, nature of competition, the ability to represent different segments of the population in the system and to produce governable coalitions uh, and, and legislatures, okay? And so these are the sort of broad theoretical reasons why I'm looking at this particular issue and how I'll kind of come full circle in the Indonesian case. So, as the title suggested, I'm looking at two different elements of electoral reform. The first is one that is probably the much more commonly studied in political science is what we would call the inter-party dimension. These are rules that affect the competition between parties, how seats are allocated between party A and party B. So this can be everything from more proportional, what I call more inclusive systems, to less inclusive systems, majoritarian single member districts, where you might have three parties only fighting over a single seat versus in a proportional system, 10 parties fighting over three seats. Um, and it basically this looks at the different formula that determine how seats are allocated once votes have been cast. Okay. The second dimension though is far less studied in terms of systematic cross-national um, studies, and this really affects, the intra-party dimension really affects competition within parties. These are the distribution of seats to specific individuals once the seats have been allocated to parties. So once we go through the first step and we figure out which party gets how many seats, then we determine who gets those seats. And sometimes those are directly related and sometimes it's a more sequential, um, in the Indonesian case as I explained, it's a more sequential process. Right, and then here, the sort of two extremes are systems that are party-centric where parties determine virtually everything. Um, and parties can determine those things differently. Some of them will hold primaries, some of them it's an internal ballot, some of them it's just party leadership, versus candidate-centric systems where there's sort of more voter choice, where candidates can present themselves directly to voters and have voters select them rather than a party that subsequently selects them, okay? And so when we talk about what we expect to see from these reforms, there are a couple of very specific theoretical perspectives about both why countries employ changes of these natures and then what they're supposed to produce, right? Why parties chose them sometimes relates, not always, to what comes after. With that inter-party reform, the distribution of seats between parties, we typically look at seat maximizing motivations. So party A pursues a reform to be more or less inclusive because it perceives that that reform is going to net the party more seats in the next election. Um, and this is a little bit easier sort of mathematically to understand uh, if you look at shifts in system types, partly because here we're really competing between party A, party B, party C. It's much easier to sit back and say, these rules will affect exactly how I get seats, not who I have to give them to, but how I get them from voters. And so it's fairly simple to say, overly simplistic depending on your point of view, but simple to say, we employ these types of changes to either gain more seats or prevent ourselves from losing seats in the next election, right? 
And so in general, the logic has been adopting reforms that make the system more inclusive, usually more proportional, tends to lead to more parties. Uh, and more parties tends to be more democratic oftentimes, and again, we can debate that, but more democratic because you're not excluding anyone, right? You're keeping competition open, you're keeping things open in, to sort of smaller represent, representative groups. And so the more inclusive tends to lead to perceptions of more democratic. Less inclusive by its very nature because it tends to often very drastically reduce the number of parties who can win and be represented, tends to lead to perceptions of less democratic, right? And so when we talk about the expectation of this type of reform, it, it's a fairly clear path of what we expect to see from the cause of the reform to the outcome of more democratic or less. Intra-party reform, though, is a little bit more difficult. Um, in intra-party reform, the causal rationales tend to be much more diverse because it's not as clear if I am a party that allowing voters to choose individual candidates is necessarily better or worse for my future performance in the election, right? Maybe I perceive that allowing individual candidates to run their own campaigns, spend their own money, get votes for my party is good for me in seats, but maybe it's bad because what it really means is candidate A from my party is competing with candidate B from my party and they actually cancel each other out, right? And so it's not as clear that this is a purely seat maximizing effort most of the time. Uh, these tend to be reforms that kind of come down to more ideological or necessity based arguments perceptions that parties are too closed, perceptions that voters' voices are not being heard. And so when these types of reforms are adopted, it tends to have a distinct cause that is not purely, I expect to get more seats or prevent myself from losing seats. And so when we talk about the expectations for how that affects democracy, unfortunately, a lot of the arguments, depending on the country <laughs> in question, tend to lead to both of these types of reforms tend to lead to more democracy, which may or may not be true. Um, and some of this gets at the lack of clear expectations and lack of clear systematic study of these things thus far, right? So party-centric reforms are typically thought to be done to strengthen party discipline, to strengthen party programs and party unity, um, and that arguably would be more democratic if you're in a system that doesn't have strong parties that don't advocate programs. But if you're more candidate-centric, these tend to be systems where individual case studies have shown there's better service orientation of the candidates elected, uh, better service provision, less corruption because individuals are held accountable to their voters. And so these tend to be perceived to be more democratic as well. And so unfortunately, when we look at the expectations, while inter-party reforms have a clear sort of divergent trajectory, intra-party reforms, less studied, uh, tend to be less clear, okay? So how does this relate to democratization? Well, it does so in three specific ways. And I'm gonna argue here that there are three types of outcomes, particularly with respect to the Indonesian case, where we can see how reforms have affected these elements of democratization. Um, and unfortunately, these are things that are difficult to do in a multi-country study. The first is that the effects of a party system, on the party system from reforms tend to be large, right? These are usually the reasons reforms are undertaken in the first place. Um, but in party systems, usually reforms of any of these natures tend to affect things like the number of parties competing, the number of parties succeeding in competition, uh, the number of new parties that feel they can and cannot enter the political arena, as well as shifting loyalty among the existing parties in the system, right? And so we often think about reforms affecting the size of the party system and the nature of competition between parties and within parties, sort of full stop. But we also look sometimes at whether or not reforms can affect election quality, right? So if reforms are undertaken and they reduce voter certainty, electoral certainty, and education is not great, turnout might go down, right? I might say, I just don't want to go vote. I don't understand how the system works. I knew how the old system works, but it's not worth my time to learn how the new system works. I don't think I can find the information, so I'm just not going to vote. Could also increase wasted votes. Um, and this is not necessarily votes that are invalid ballots, although traditionally reforms tend to produce a larger number of invalid ballots as well. Um, but wasted votes in the sense of shifts between how seats are allocated within parties and among parties can increase the number of people who vote for a party not understanding the new system and its incentives, whose votes essentially are wasted on a party that doesn't get any seats. And finally, reforms can actually directly lead to either an increase or decrease in violence and instability from the standpoint that if I perceive that a reform has been undertaken that is not particularly democratic or not done with my best interests in mind, Maybe the logical conclusion is to protest and demonstrate and possibly 
produce violence as a means to being heard. Okay? Um, I will say, at least in the Indonesian case, reforms tend to actually have the opposite effect of reducing violence and instability, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Finally, and this is sort of the newest portion uh, of this research uh, agenda for me, is looking at the actual legislative effects, right? Because I'm really looking predominantly at legislative elections. Executive elections are different. There's usually one seat, one set of rules, and they don't change as much. But in terms of legislative effects, the different reforms can have an effect on whether incumbents are likely to be reelected or even have a chance of being reelected. Uh, and I'll talk specifically about how that looks. Um, the institutional memory in the legislative body. So if incumbents are not reelected and no one in a sitting legislature has any experience on committee, probably not going to be particularly effective governors right off the bat. No experience with procedure, rules, and, and the like. And finally, I'm going to look a little bit at characteristics of individuals elected under different types of rules. Right? This includes minorities, women, and different <coughs> kind of segments of society that might be more or less affected in terms of their success at uh, getting elected with different types of systems and changes in particular. Okay? Am I going too fast? Sorry, I speak really quickly. So. All right. So let me focus on the Indonesian case now that we've kind of gotten the theoretical expectations out of the way. Um, I'm guessing most of you are relatively familiar, but uh, we're looking at a country with 17,000 islands. They're not all inhabited, of course. Um, about 1,000 have substantial enough populations to receive regular government services. And about 242 million people, depending on whose estimates in exactly what year. Right? This is a very large country, a large case. It is, however, an extraordinarily diverse case as well. Right? So it is a majority Muslim country, but only about 85% of the population is Muslim. And so there is a substantial minority population composed of, at least by census rules, Christians, Catholics, Hindus, Buddhists, uh, and one or two other distinctions. Um, the majority of the population lives on Java, which is impressive because it's not a particularly big island. Um, but there is certainly, in terms of electoral reform over the years, and on Java, off Java, tint tank to light some of the choices of districting and rule changes to balance between those on Java and those off of Java. Finally, there's no majority ethnic group. The Javanese are the largest at, depends on whose estimates, but somewhere between 40 and 45 percent. Okay? Um, what this means, of course, is that we're talking about a lot of subgroups that perceive themselves to either need representation directly for the group or via one of the existing parties um, in the system. 1965 to 97, and again, kind of depends on your perception of when exactly new order comes out of guided democracy, um, but you have essentially a 30-year regime that ends in 1998 with a transition under President Habibi. Uh, first elections are held in 1999. Indonesia now possesses the world's largest single-day elections by a, a substantial margin if you consider the low voter turnout in the United States. Um, and when we say they're the largest single day elections, I really actually mean they're the largest half day elections in the world. They pull, the polls are open from 8 a.m. to noon at 500,000 plus polling stations across the islands. There are 173 plus million registered voters and each polling station has ballots officially for 500 voters plus a number of blank ballots for voters who show up to a particular balloting uh, box with new identification, change of address, not change of address, but identification that lists them as being able to vote in that precinct rather than another one. Okay? This is a lot of people voting in what are still boxes and papers and when noon comes around, they're done voting and they have six hours to open the boxes and I showed you that picture before, make hash mark tallies for the 500 plus ballots in each of the boxes. And then they're supposed to put them onto an Excel, Excel spreadsheet and send them to Jakarta. That last part tends to not happen very well, um, but this is how elections are conducted and it's a massive scale. Right? This is a coordination effort really kind of unmatched certainly for the amount of time it's squished into in the world. Now, this is also a system that, despite the sort of complexity and, and difficulty of conducting the elections by themselves, has also undergone a serious amount of change. So this is a system where every five years, just before the elections, usually a year or two before, they pass a new election, new or revised election law, depending on who you ask, that has occasionally substantially overhauled the way elections are conducted, but always provide for at least some measure of change between 
election at time t and election at time t minus 1. In 1999, the system was province level districts, no electoral threshold, closed list PR. So you as a voter showed up, you punched for a single party, and the votes were calculated at the province level, although there was some sub province, I wouldn't say gerrymandering, but jiggering with the election results. Um, in 1999, all parties were required to be nationally oriented. So you had to have uh, registration and offices in a certain proportion of the provinces and a certain proportion of the districts within each of those provinces. So there's no regional parties in 1999. 2004, same for the parties, although the registration barriers are higher. Now we have three to 12 seat districts. Some of these are entire provinces. Some of them are subdivisions of administrative units. The districts in 2004, though, are not necessarily uh, complementary to administrative units. Some of them are half of a district. Some of them are three districts. Some of them are an entire province. But each of them are somewhere between three and 12 seats, largely standardizing the number of seats available on any individual ballot. There is still no electoral threshold to get into the legislature. And now we have a semi-open list. Um, and I say semi-open, but still largely closed. Parties now provided a rank ordering of individual candidates, and you as a voter could choose an individual candidate, but your choice largely did not get to override party rank ordering. You had to have a really, really, you as an individual candidate had to have a really, really high number of individual votes to override the system. So even though you have the choice as a voter, as a candidate, you're still kind of operating under very party-centric functions. 2009. Seats, seats per district stay relatively the same, although a number of districts get subdivided and the seat numbers go down. There is now a 2.5% threshold. Parties failing to receive 2.5% of the national vote don't get any seats in the legislature. 2.5 is not a particularly high number, but in a country with 172 million registered voters, you could get 5 million votes and not get any seats. Right? So just some perspective for what 2.5% means in Indonesia. Now in 2009, the same semi-open list system actually existed on paper in the election law and was struck down by the constitutional court with one of the, ironically, candidates challenging the rule and forced to be completely open list. So parties had submitted rank ordered positions expecting that the rank orders would matter. Voters got to choose and all that mattered at the end of the day was who had the most votes for the party in the district. So the rank ordering meant technically nothing at all, although one and two were disproportionately chosen relative to the others. Um, but this is actually how a number of women got their seats. So definitely had some effect on certain groups. Uh, in 2014, same seat districts, not for lack of trying, they did try to change this. 3.5% um, threshold uh, that was originally discussed at 5%, so much higher. Uh, and they maintain the same open list PR as before. So between 2009 and 2014, you see fewer changes in the overall structure and the method. Voters will see relatively the same ballot as before, uh, although there are far fewer parties competing in 2014 than there were in 2009. Um, but I will say the changes discussed for the current election were actually much more sweeping changes that just didn't pass, partly because, um, and I'll talk in a second about the sort of issue of legislative quality, um, these legislators had two years to revise this law and couldn't come to agreements or decisions on most of the major changes they wanted to implement. All right. So we have party system effects uh, over time. So how does this actually matter? Well, the first is that over time, particularly the opening of the list, tended to cause a serious amount of party internal fragmentation and shifting loyalty. So for those of you familiar with the system, we have two parties, Golkar, and PKB. So this, of course, is the party under New Order, and this is uh, the party most closely associated with one of the mass Islamic organizations in Indonesia. Each of them had run in 1999 and 2004, um, and in 2009, each of them, I would say sponsored, but that would be a little too generous, um, each of them generated fragment parties, Hanura uh, on the one hand and the PKNU on the other hand, that broke off uh, partly to capitalize on the changes in the election law related to candidate centricity, um, and partly because the leaders of these two fragment parties no longer got along with the leaders of the other two parties. So uh, some of it electorally related and some of it just related to personal preferences. Um, but more importantly, they could do this partly because the rules 
up till 2009 had been extremely permissive for new party entrants. And so the logic behind why they decided to run pervaded. There had been no threshold up until then. 2.5% is not actually that high in some respects. And so both of these new parties began under the assumption they would win seats and would be able to win seats away from the parties that had essentially from which they had come. Uh, they were both right to some degree. Uh, Hanora actually managed to make the threshold uh, despite being a brand new party created the year before the election um, as a very personalistic vehicle. Um, we'll run in this election. We'll probably be just at or around the threshold in this election um, and has subsequently won a couple of minor victories at the district level in the interim years. The PKNU, on the other hand, failed to make the threshold, but very, very significantly damaged the PKB's vote share in a particular part of the islands I'll show you in a second on the map. Um, without actually getting any of the seats, clearly took voters directly from the PKB in a handful of districts, and without the threshold would have won seats in those districts. Um, many of those votes actually went back to parties like Golkar and the PDIP. Okay? And so we actually see that the sort of fragmentation of these parties has had a distinct effect on both the ability of newcomers to compete, but also the ability of parties to kind of maintain sort of the purpose of parties, which is to aggregate interests and push for very specific policies that everybody wants. So second issue is proliferation of new party entrants, and I just discussed that a little bit. Um, between 2004 and 2009, uh, you had three brand new entrants, essentially, that did quite well, Parte Democrat, Hanora, and Garindra. National Democrat is now running in 2014 as another new fragment party um, that will actually likely also make the threshold. Um, but what I want to show you is this. So these are the DPR seat distributions, darker bars for each of the parties on the left, to the lighter bars over time. In 2004, the PK, or the PKS, and the Parte Democrat were both essentially new parties. And you'll see here, they both got substantial portions of the seats in the legislature as brand new parties competing in elections where you have to win a large number of votes to get seats, right? In 2009, again, you have two brand new parties, Hanora and Garindra, that just decide to run the year before the election, throw together a party, throw together offices, put together voter lists and candidate lists, and still manage to get, again, millions of votes. Right? And so this is a type of system that is ex has been extraordinarily permissive, uh, and it's not exactly <coughs> clear that the reduction in inclusivity has actually prevented or deterred anybody from entering the system anew, although new registration barriers in 2014 have taken care of that, which oh, I'm happy to talk about, but I won't hear for lack of complicating. Finally, there has been an overall reduction in the number of party competitors. This does not mean new parties don't enter, but existing parties that failed to make thresholds, that failed to win substantial numbers of seats, now have faced high enough barriers that most of them have decided not to run again. Um, and I was actually just speaking with one of the uh, central board members of the PKB, and he actually expressed that they had reincorporated a number of the PKNU's candidates from 2009 into their list for 2014, because the PKNU basically folded a couple years ago and returned home, which is how they like to phrase it, um, but returned back to the party from which most of them had originally come. And this is partly why. So this is the country, um, and the colors represent the different parties that failed to make the threshold at the 2.5% level, but would have actually won the seat or multiple seats in the districts they ran in. And the PKNU is right here in the center. These are four extraordinarily populous districts in East Java. Each of these are very, very, very large districts. Winning those seats was enormous, like a, a substantial vote share. Those votes will probably all literally return to the PKB now. The PKB won a single seat in each of those districts. It will likely win two in almost all of them this next time. Right? And so this is what some of the threshold and different rule changes have done, is it's really kind of forced a reconsolidation in some respects of parties that probably should really be single entities rather than four or five, or in some cases more. Now, in terms of election quality, the changes have had different effects. So turnout has dropped over the last 15 years, which is not surprising. Most new democracies see a fairly substantial drop off. Um, what is useful is that most of the projections for 2014 put them somewhere in the mid 60s so the drop-off hopefully will not be quite as big in this next election. Um, and some of the reason for the hopefulness of this next election is the presidential race in July and the popularity of a particular candidate that will likely run in July. Um, 
But nevertheless, turnout is dropping. It's not clear, though, that the turnout is dropping because of the election rule changes. Uh, voters that I talked to when I was observing elections in 2009 did not seem to indicate that they were frustrated with the system or the mechanism of selection as a reason for voting or not voting. Wasted votes have gone up. Um, well, actually, they went down in 2004, ironically, um, partly because there were fewer party contestants, and so there were fewer votes to be wasted. Um, and they went up again in 2009. Supposition was that they went up drastically in 2009 because of the threshold, but if you add back in the parties that would have made the threshold, you still would have had about 11.5% wasted votes. So wasted votes did go up in the last election. They will probably stay relatively high in this election. But again, there are only 12 parties competing in this election, so the likelihood of casting a vote for a party that doesn't make it is lower than it was in 2009. Violence and instability, though, are one of the few things that this process seems to have not actually harmed and in some ways has helped. So there, the system is marked by high communal violence and civil conflict between 2000 and 2006, um, and election-related violence was sporadic I would like to say largely localized, although it tended to have spillover effects. Um, but in 2009, and again in this election, intimidation is relatively localized, and it is really very specifically in places like Aceh and Papua, not necessarily related to separatist issues, but related to mechanisms of local control and party control. In general, this is not a system in the last two elections that, been, that has been marked by election-related violence. There are a lot of protests. There are a lot of court cases lodged. But there are protests and court cases lodged. There are few, if any, things that spill over into anything resembling sort of broader systemic instability. Um, and part of the reason for the local intimidation in Aceh is that Aceh is the only place in the country that is allowed to have regional parties, um, per the Helsinki Agreement and the law on Aceh governance in 2006. And unfortunately, a lot of the intimidation factors are related directly to those regional parties that are not allowed to compete at the national level and don't exist anywhere else in Indonesia. Almost every report uh, that I've ever heard comes from one of those parties that is allowed by this law to exist. Okay. Now, the legislative effects are really kind of what's been interesting for me in, in the most recent wave of uh, research. So in 2009, the incumbency retention rate was actually about a quarter. So a quarter of the incumbents who ran again won back their seats. It's a relatively low incumbency rate. Certainly if you are from the US or Australia or Canada, right, incumbency rates are relatively high. Um, and more specifically, a number of the number one ranked by their party incumbents were not selected, were actually very specifically selected around by individuals listed lower on the list. Um, many were members of Commission 2, which is actually, ironically, the commission that determines revisions to the election law. So the, these have essentially been put in place by them, and then they got voted out by them. Uh, the, both the chair and one of his vice chairs in 2009 from the commission that actually wrote this election law were replaced by the voters, by people ranked much lower down the list. Uh, both are running again in this election, so I guess we'll see how that goes. One for a new party. Um, what you did see, however, was a lot of artists and celebrities elected in 2009, or at least if you paid any attention to the parties that didn't do well, they complained that all the other parties that had done well had run all these artists and celebrities. Um, in general, though, and I'm, I'm basing this on both survey data of the population as well as experts that I've talked to over the last couple of years, the currently sitting legislators have been far more criticized for a lack of experience, a lack of interest in their jobs, a lack of focus, a lack of knowledge about how to write laws, how to make policy. Um, and a lot of the experts that I've talked to have criticized them very directly in contrast to the 2004, 2009 legislature that had a much higher incumbency retention rate and a larger number of technocrats who retained their seats because they weren't competing for individual vote shares. Um, and more importantly, we're not competing against members of their own party for individual vote shares. Finally, one of the other things that we've noted, uh, women were actually benefited to some degree by the open list system in 2009. Um, in 2009, a gender and quota and placement mandate were adopted. 30% uh, of the list must be women, and every one in three positions had to be a woman. Um, and so that did a tremendous amount to increase the number of female candidates. Uh, but the open list actually enabled more women who were ranked lower by their parties to be elected than women who were ranked higher by their parties and chosen against by the voters. And so on some level, the open list system actually provided more space for particular groups of the population to directly appeal to voters on issues of 
most women were running on platforms of, we're not part of the existing system, and you all think the existing system is corrupt, so vote for us, because we're not corrupt, which unfortunately it turned out a number of them were. But, um, but they ran on that platform in 2009 quite convincingly in a number of districts, particularly in the urban areas. Right? And so part of what, what we've sort of noted about this uh, phenomenon in Indonesia is that the open list actually had the benefit of enabling certain groups to make direct appeals to voters in a way that the system before really did not allow them to do. Um, since I'm kind of running short on time, I'm going to skip through the uh, multi-country study. If anyone's really curious about this stuff, I'm happy to talk about it. It wasn't a paper, but um, it's kind of a preliminary analysis anyway. So implications of the Indonesian case study for others, and kind of focus on that. So the first is that this issue of intra-party reform is one that kind of needs to be unpacked and in particular looked at with respect to other reforms that have occurred. So the shift from being able to vote only for a party to being able to select an individual candidate was a big change for voters, but voters weren't the only ones affected by this, right? The parties then had to figure out how to adjudicate letting individual members of their parties run campaigns not only against individual members of other parties, but against individual members from their own parties. And so it's not as clear as the district sizes have shrunk, as the threshold has gone up, that a lot of the parties, as well as their candidates, have really understood what to do with, I can make personal appeals, I can make individual appeals, but it might actually harm my party and my chances of getting in at all if we don't coordinate. Um, and so there have been a number of more practical, functional things that the Indonesian parties have undergone in terms of learning how to deal with this system that just adopting a system on the grounds that we wanted there to be better voter choice and more accountability don't take into consideration. The second is that, um, and this is actually what a lot of the manuscript looks at uh, for my book, this issue of the causes of reform, right? We might be able to assume that more or less proportional systems are adopted on the grounds that parties are maintaining seat shares or preserving uh, the potential for seat shares, but it's not as clear with intra-party reforms, shifts between candidates and parties, that the same kind of motivations apply. And some of it is because a lot of non-legislative actors are the ones pushing these policies. Uh, international donor agencies tend to push a lot of these policies for transparency and accountability reasons. Uh, civil society members do. And the courts have gotten involved at almost every stage uh, since 2004 of Indonesian election monitoring and conduct as well. All of these actors bring very different interests than I want party A to win a certain number of seats or I want party B to win a certain number of seats. They bring very, very wildly different ideas about what should and could happen under these systems. And so understanding where the reforms come from might give us a better sense of understanding what comes out of the process. Finally, um, and for those of you who read the paper probably understand this a little bit, my frustration is that we need sort of better measures of what we mean by democratic consolidation. It's a little too easy to, re to rely on a single quantitative indicator as a predictor in a model when I sort of talked about a number of different factors that might be affected by the reforms that clearly affects quality of democracy and certainly trajectory, right? Demographics or characteristics of legislative members are difficult to get in cross-national comparisons. But very clearly, these rule changes have very distinct effects on distinct subgroups of the population in a way that might have longer term consequences for democracy. Certainly in a country like Indonesia where the only Christian party that did exist was eliminated by the threshold and often did not run particularly popular candidates and candidates who don't want to run with other parties, this is presenting a serious problem for a particular minority group within the country. And so how that gets adjudicated by future rule changes will probably determine a lot of how well their incorporation continues. So this kind of gets to issues of future research. Um, and the, these are really sort of just broad things that the book and related pieces will look at. But, um, but for anyone writing a dissertation, if you want to pick some of these up, I'd be happy to <laughs> talk to you about it. Um, but whether or not electoral reforms really affects particular individual success, likelihood of success, chance at election. Um, I'm currently working on a piece on whether or not shifts between different types of systems affect women. and. The punchline is that they very clearly do, and in some very unexpected ways. Um, but racial, ethnic, and regional minorities in a number of countries are very distinctly affected by the types of changes adopted by countries, often because some of these changes are adopted specifically to circumvent certain groups from <coughs> having a certain amount of a voice. Um, and particularly incumbents from the standpoint that, while I'm never a big fan of the idea that just because you're an incumbent, you must be better at your job, 
I can understand a reluctance to have a new democracy with uh, a second legislature with almost no one in it who knows how to make a law because no one has ever held an office. Um, and so there are certainly uh, benefits to having incumbents around, uh, at least at some modest rate. Um, one of the other projects that I'm looking at, and this is particularly interesting from the Indonesian case standpoint, is that the subnational level often adopts similar reforms to the national level. In the Indonesian case as a unitary state, the subnational level actually follows very directly from the national level, but even in federal systems, reforms at the national level tend to have a trickle-down effect, particularly when they benefit certain parties. So looking at this kind of within-country variation uh, is one area that I'm pursuing. And then finally, and I briefly alluded to this before, but the relationship between how rules affect competition between parties and how it affects competition within parties are oftentimes very highly dependent on each other, or at least very interdependent on what happens in the other side of things. And so while you could just adopt a more or less inclusive reform or a more or less party-centric reform, a number of cases uh, around the world tend to adopt these in conjunction, either in a move to a mixed system or from a mixed system, uh, or in the Indonesian case, completely separately affect both types of competition. And so understanding how these two things kind of play off each other is tremendously important to understanding how and why representation is sort of very, very distinct uh, after the fact. Thank you. Yeah.